Next step in the process is to make a T-slot cutter for that particular feature right there. And that is tiny. 125 across the bottom with an 075 lead in. 75 thousandths of an inch thick. 125 deep. And this is the tool that is going to do that. This is a piece of 1 8 inch high speed steel. This is uh, the back side of a broken extended center drill. So it's perfect. Just pull it out of the box. It's already ground to the 125. And if that doesn't meet 125 when you start your cut, well, then just walk the cutter back and forth. Just make sure that the shank of the cutter will clear this right there. Try not to go any smaller when you grind your tool or form your tool. And to be honest with you, I was going to do this with a cutoff wheel, but the cutoff wheels I have are just too soft and continue to break down and not give me the sharp corners I was looking for inside. So I'm going to do this a rather unconventional way, and I don't even know if it's going to work right now, but I know carbide cuts high speed, right? So let's put this in a 5C spin indexer and do this form tool in the mill. Keep your fingers crossed on this one. I think this is probably going to cost me an end mill or two. <laughs> let's see what happens. Part currently set up in the 5C spin indexer. I'm going to uh, plunge very slowly as I spin this by hand. And hopefully the edges of the cutter don't break down too fast. But I will go for the 075 neck in the back with a 75, 77 land left in the front. Then I can do the flutes. So let's check it out. I'm using a four flute carbide 1 8 inch diameter end mill for this. That's 125. It's about 3 millimeters for all you UK guys. And the easiest way to locate a cutter is to actually take a dust cut off the face of the part you're going to cut. And just walking it gently back and forth until we see some dust flying off of there. You can set your DRO or your dials to zero at this point. Clean it up. And once you have a clean face, you'll know that with a zero dial, all you need to do is move in the thickness of the cutter diameter in order to align the outside of the tool with the outside of the part. And here comes the shift. All right, at this point, the cutter is now aligned with the face I just cut and a little extra movement there for the thickness that you want your cutter to be. Now, bear in mind, once you neck this down, it's going to be very difficult to get back in there and face that face off because it's going to have a tendency to jump around quite aggressively. I'm making sure that the cutter is going to clear the collet at this point. Moving directly over the center of the part. And this is actually accelerated footage. This is a very slow process, so nothing blows up. I do not want to break the teeth off the bottom of this end mill. So the quill is locked. I'm coming up with the table very slowly. And be sure that if you're going to attempt this, that you allow to cutter or allow the indexer to go one complete rotation before you move the table up or you will just exponentially load the cutter and the cutter will cut deeper and deeper and deeper as it's trying to revolve around this diameter and that will lead to a premature failure. I'm looking for about an 075 diameter. I'm going to take uh, the 75 is the dimension on the print so I'm going to go for around 70 thousandths because I know I have a 125 full body diameter on the front. And check back with your drawing and make sure that whatever width cutter that you are using will give you sufficient clearance on the remaining dimension on the print. Once you know you have your relief diameter sufficiently put in there, we're going to put the cutting teeth on this cutter. Ideally, you want the edge of the cutter on center with the blank. And you can see it's starting to look like a cutter right now. It is okay if you go a little bit too far with this. It'll just uh, be more of an aggressive cutter like a router bit. If you ever look at a router bit, you can see the flutes are 
incredibly off center to each other and that just gives it a more hook profile as it comes around. I'm going to take the depth of the little flat right there and I'm going to go until I nick the undercut in the back. You can just barely see a little scratch line as it comes around the reflection. So I'm happy with the center right now and I'm going on the depth. You can see the cutter has reached the uh, relief diameter on this tool. You want to remove the full body diameter of the blank that you'll use or all you will do is rub and it will be very difficult to cut. One final pass without anything moving so if there's any cutter flex it will be the same for both sides. Primary relief sufficient would be 5 degrees, 7 degrees on the very first cut to give you a cutting edge. But for doing what I'm doing, I know I'm cutting extremely gummy material. And on a small diameter like this, the angle isn't really going to have a tremendous effect. So if you watch how the cutter step that I just milled in there is rotated, that's about a 40 degree primary on there. The top of the blank has been blacked out with a Sharpie marker. And I'm coming up with the table until that little area right there disappears. You don't want to go too far because now it will affect your diameter that this tool will effectively cut. I'm planning on a little bit of end mill deterioration, maybe some edges going away. Rough it first. Make sure that if the cutter is not spinning concentric, this particular cut will be different from side to side and you could get yourself in trouble and stress out one side of the cutter more than the other. Well, once you like what you see, come up with your final height. Now it's starting to look like a Z. And that Z is formed by two primary relief cuts and the initial cut that formed the two flute geometry. You can make a four flute if you want, just be careful uh, how thin it gets. Okay, you can see the cutting edges being formed and some remnant black still left on there. That's the full diameter from the 125 initial blank. As long as that goes away, you're going to have clearance. So this cut right here is completely at your discretion. But for sake of getting those gummy chips out of there on the aluminum that I'll be cutting, I'm going to take this down probably farther than it needs to be. And then I will take it over to the sander and I'll take the faceted edges out of it. Just as so long as I know I have that edge right there on both sides exposed, should be good to go. It is highly recommended that you test your new cutter on a piece of scrap material. Try to replicate or simulate the exact conditions that you'll be using. That way you know the load on the cutter that it sees here is what it's going to see when you actually do the feature that you're attempting to do. And the one thing bad about doing such a small feature on such a large machine is you just can't feel any resistance from the cutter. The machine itself is so heavy that moving small cutters like this through is really tedious on the first try. The chip that it's kicking out is looking good. It's kind of sandy, but you're not expecting a, a long chip because it's not a helical cutter. So this is more of a scraping type cutter, a very sharp, very aggressive cutter because of the 40 degree primary. Take a look at the surface finish that you have. And if it's all torn up and ugly and smeared, you know it's dragging more than it is cutting. Look at the bottom faces. Look at the sides. Look at the burrs that it's throwing. Look for anything that looks out of place and make sure that the relief that you put in there, the minor diameter, clears the slot on top. 
running it back through in the opposite direction is always good. It shows you if it's capable of passing back through its own channel without having a real problem. Now you got some nice chips coming out of there. You know it's good and sharp. I say this cutter's a win. Let's take a look at it on the bench. Decent clean cut inside. The top will be the first operation that I do when I cut the slots in the in the faceplate. I will slot it according to the print and I will go completely to depth. So when I come in with the T-slot cutter, it is just barely tickling the bottom of the original cut put in there. And I may actually beforehand, I know that this is 75 tall and 125 wide. I might put a pair of holes in here side by side just to remove the bulk of the material and take some of the stress off the cutter. But by the looks of it, the amount of material that that cutter will be removing uh, doesn't compare to the shank size. So I do not think it will overwhelm the cutter. I may just go with this conventional slot and leave it at that. But I like it. Worked out well.